Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Anselm of Canterbury, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> so, the last two talks, we were looking at what our desire for God means, and how that desire is a consequence of something real in our life, that God is real in my life, and that my way to understand that is part of my journey of life, to come into terms with that reality. But a proof of that reality is that I have a desire for God. So with this desire, with this reality in my life, what goes wrong? What goes wrong? The journalist... Malcolm Muggeridge, in his um, autobiography, wrote this. The saddest thing to me in looking back on my life has been to recall not so much the wickedness I have been involved in, the cruel and selfish things I have done, the hurt that I have inflicted on those I love, although that's painful enough. What hurts most is the preference I have shown for what is inferior, second rate, when the first rate was always there for the having. Like the man who goes shopping for shoes and comes back with cardboard ones instead of leather, with dried fruit when he might have had fresh, with processed cheese when he might have had cheddar, with paper flowers when the roses were in bloom. Nothing is so beautiful and wonderful, nothing so continually fresh and surprising, so full of sweet ecstasy as the good. No desert is so dreary, monotonous and boring as evil. So what goes wrong? What went wrong in the lives of the monks described by St. Benedict? They make the gratification of their desires their only law. Whatsoever they fancy or prefer, this they call holy. They never stop. They're always moving from place to place. Slaves of their own wills and the enticements of the belly. Something goes wrong. A basic disunity comes into a life. And this unity, disunity is expressed in various words. One of them is mediocrity. Another is apathy, and another one is sloth. And these are powerful words. Another word is the word assidia. And assidia was used uh, by the early fathers of the church to describe the sort of sense of, I can't be bothered. I can't be asked. I just, you know, it's all too much. And they called it the noonday demon. It's the sense of coming out, looking up and thinking, what's the point? And for our present situation, that's something that we need to be really aware of. This doing half things half-heartedly. Just for like things like not getting out of bed in the morning, sitting all day in front of the television, just dawdling around. And it's particularly difficult when we are with isolation. That's why a timetable, a disciplined of life is so important, not just, not just for when we're working, but all the time, to make sure that we have a routine, that we do the important things of life. I saw a couple of weeks ago an address at the end of, um, for some, uh, at a military academy, and it was given by an admiral to all these young men and women who were graduating from their academy. And he says, I want to tell you the most important thing that you can do any day. And you can see their faces waiting from this grizzled old admiral. He said, when you get out of bed, make your bed. And they all laughed. But there's a wisdom. There is a real wisdom. Because it's in doing the ordinary, everyday things well that it begins to shape our day. The problem is that we are half-hearted. 
We can be mediocre. We can go halfway down the path. When I entered the seminary, I had a wonderful spiritual director called Father Ken Collins. And um, he was a great priest, a remarkable priest. And uh, I went in one day for my spiritual direction, which I go to roughly once a month. And he said to me, John, how's it going? I said, it's going very well, thank you, Father. It's going very well. He said, how's the studies? I said, yeah, yeah, going fine, yeah, doing well. And how are you getting on with the other students? I said, yeah, very good, yeah, yeah, nice bunch of lads getting on all very well. And what about your prayer? Yep, I pray, no problem at all. And he looked at me with a wry smile on his face. He says, you know, you're a very good seminarian, aren't you? And I sort of said, well, yeah, I suppose so. Not realising the enormous hole I was just about to fall into. He said, John, you're a good seminarian, but are you God's seminarian? And I said, what's the difference? And for the next hour, he proceeded to tell me what the difference was. And it was an important moment. Because like the rich young man that we reflected on yesterday, the rich young man was a good man. And as Jesus said what he must do to inherit eternal life. The young man said, yes, I do those things. And there is a goodness in all of our lives. But the question is not, are we good? But are we what God wants us to be? Being good, very often, means doing the things that we're happy with. When we hand over to God, we find out what God's will is in our life. The half-heartedness of mediocrity, apathy, sloth, acidia stops us. It puts a wall up. We will go so far, but then we stop. We'll do so much, and then we stop. And when Jesus says to us, go sell everything and give your money to the poor, and we say, whoa, hang on a minute, that's a bit much. Lord, you surely don't want me to stop that. And we walk away sad. Well, we're all aware of what makes us sad. And this is part of the reason why in our lives and in our faith, we only go so far. We give what we're prepared to give. But God asks us to go further. Muggeridge continues. In both cases, it seemed to me the significant thing was the ready acceptance of fantasy as reality even a predilection in favour of fantasy and an abhorrence of reality. Why? It was the question of questions confronting me. I could only wail and lament by the lakeshore as I remembered my own readiness to take to the plastic wings of fantasy, to the sounds and sweet airs which give such delight and not hurt not So that when I awake, but I never do, I cry to go back to sleep again. All I could claim, so small a claim, was that I knew, had always known, would always know, that the alternative reality existed. And that all too carelessly and faithlessly I had looked for it, aware that this quest was the only true and serious purpose life held. The questions of Jesus that he asks, that we're reflecting upon during the homilies, are big questions. They're not, what do you want for dinner? They're not, what's on the telly tonight? They are questions that change our lives. And this quest, this quest to become who God has created us to be, is the only true and serious purpose that life holds. Therefore, we need to move from this apathy, from this lukewarmness. Remember the book of Revelation. It writes, Write this to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. You are lukewarm. 
neither hot nor cold, so I will spit you out of my mouth. You think you are rich and have piled up so much that you need nothing, but you do not realise that you are wretched and to be pitied, poor, blind and naked. Hard words, harsh words, but words that well go to the very heart of our struggle. We are lukewarm, half-hearted, neither hot nor cold. The first step in addressing this harsh statement is, do I recognise this in myself? Or is he talking about someone else? Is this not you? Is this not me? Well, let's be honest with ourselves. The answer is, yes, it is us. It is me. It is you. It's part of the reason we're on retreat. To be honest, to be truthful about ourselves. And it's this knowledge of ourself which is an essential for any spiritual journey. One of the uh, in medieval times in England, there were some remarkable mystical writers who wrote about the spiritual life. It is one of our great treasuries in England of these great mystics. One of them, whose name we don't know, wrote a book called The Cloud of Unknowing. And this is what he writes, or she. Should all the saints and angels in heaven join with all the members of the church on earth, both religious and lay, at every degree of Christian holiness and pray for my growth in humility, I am certain it would not profit me as much nor bring me to the perfection of this virtue as quickly as a little self-knowledge. Indeed, it is altogether impossible to arrive at perfect humility without it. And therefore, do not shrink from the sweat and toil engaged in gaining real self-knowledge. For I am sure that when you have acquired it, you will very soon come to a knowledge of God's goodness and love. So for us to become aware of ourselves, we have to recognise this basic disunity. Father Michael Casey, who wrote the wonderful reflection on the... Um, on Lexio Divina, which has been posted, uh, he writes this in his book, Living in Truth. And I would commend to you this book. It is a remarkable book. It's one of the great modern classics, Living in Truth, by Father Michael Casey, the Cistercian monk. And he writes this. And he's talking about the monk, but it's just as much about us. The monk becomes aware of thoughts and feelings that are at variance with his stated aspirations and external conduct. And he is aware that sometimes these find expression in secret activities. When this becomes more than a transitory phenomenon, he's forced to adapt a stance. He may compartmentalise his life so that the private sphere is split from his public persona. He is leading a double life. Alternatively, he may rationalise his aberrations, and this will cause his mind to be possessed by a basic untruthfulness, a profound disunity. A double life. We say one thing, and we do something else. We want this image of a good person, yet that's not actually backed up by a strong foundation. Goodness is not enough. Only God can take us from the goodness that we are happy with to the eternal happiness with God, our loving Father. And so, how do we have come to this self-knowledge? Well, one of the important things 
that we all grew up with is to examine our conscience. Now, our, examining our conscience is not to beat ourselves up. It's just to be truthful. Remember, it says in the scriptures, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, this is not just the truth of Jesus Christ, but it's one of the truths of Jesus Christ that helps us to understand the truth about ourselves. So if I take the truth of the gospel, the good news of the gospel, and I use that light to shine on the truth of myself, it will set me free. That's why the examination of conscience is so important. As we begin Mass every day, we say, I confess. But we are asked towards the end of the day to examine our conscience, to be honest with ourselves. And that honesty is life-giving. It sets us free because it's truth. And even though we may struggle, even the next day, even the next hour, knowing the truth is the first stage to finding freedom in Jesus Christ. Now, St. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, included in his great work, The Spiritual Exercises, a prayer called the Examen, the Examination. And um, he identifies a number of key points for us to do, possibly, we can do the examination of conscience every day, and that's really, in effect, we can just say the prayer that we say at Mass or when we go to confession. But the examine is a time when we could take a little bit longer. And he suggests these following points. First, place yourself in God's presence and give thanks for God's great love for you. Know that God is looking for you before you start looking for God. Pray for the grace to understand how God is acting in your life at this moment in time. Review your day and call specific moments in the course of the day where you may have turned your back on God. Reflect on what you did, did, said and thought in those instances. And are these things drawing you closer to God or further away? Look towards tomorrow. Think of how you might collaborate more effectively with God's plan and be specific and conclude with the Our Father. Because it is in the Our Father that we hear about God's forgiveness for us. This examination of conscience, if undertaken every day, every day, will help us to move along this path so that the goodness that is in us will actually lead to the fullness of God which is offered. And we will be able to say, it is no longer I that live, but God that lives in me. And so for us to be able to realistically address where I am at the moment, to look at these issues, to be honest with myself, to move beyond this basic disunity that I have in my life. Where do I stand? Where do I start? When do I start? What do I do? Well, one of the great spiritual insights of so many of our saints is an insight that says that we have to live in the present moment. Now, the present moment is now. present moment at the moment is 10 minutes to 11 on Tuesday, the 21st of April 2020. That's the present moment. It's 30 seconds on from that now. So the present moment is where we are at this present time. Now, when we look at where we live, for many of us, we don't live in the present moment. We live in the past, or we live in the future. But the past is history. There's nothing we can do about it. It's history, it's gone. Well, is there something we can do about it? Well, we can't change it, because it's gone. But there are a number of things 
how we can connect with it. The first is to say sorry. To say sorry for anything that would have been done in the past. And we're going to be look at what, looking at what that means later on during the week. But to say sorry. And because of that sorry, sorrow, a unique gift is given to us if we learn. It's called wisdom. Wisdom is learning from the effects of our past mistakes. So even our worst mistake can change us if we recognise it and have sought forgiveness. And that's called wisdom. We can say thank you. We can say thank you for all the blessings that I've had in the past. And that's pretty much all you can do with it. Or you can just carry it with you. Well, God doesn't ask us to carry these things with us. And that's what forgiveness and sorrow is there. It's there to set us free. So if we live in the past, it's because we've really not come to terms with the things we need to forgive. If we live in the past, it's because we've not said sorry. If we live in the past, it's because we've not forgiven. And we live in a place where, in effect, we can't change. We can't change the event, but we can change ourselves. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've given me. I'm sorry, Lord, for what I did. And I forgive you for what you did to me. We change the past by changing ourselves. So, what about tomorrow? What do we do about tomorrow? Well, so many of us live in the tomorrow, which is the sort of a fantasy world, which Muggeridge referred to earlier on. The fantasy of what it's going to be like tomorrow. You know, at the moment, we're all fantasizing about what it's going to be like when we get out of this lockdown. What will life be like? You know, and the question I asked yesterday do we go to the reset button? which takes us back to what we were, or the default button that takes us to that place, to the maker's instructions. And so when we look towards tomorrow, we can be kind of paralysed by what might happen. And the truth about tomorrow is we don't know what's going to happen. But the imaginary trial is always unbearable because it lacks the grace of the moment. You know, the imaginary trial of what's going to happen to us, what's going to happen to the world. Will our local pub ever open again? All these things that go round in our head, you know, the imagination that we have are the root so often of our fears, of our terrors. And that doesn't mean that there are not things to be aware of and things that, we, that do make us anxious. But what goes on in our head is actually worse than anything Hollywood could ever come up with. The imaginary trial that goes on in my head is unbearable sometimes. Why? Because it lacks the grace of the moment. You see, God's grace, God's presence, God's love, God's help, whatever you want to call it, is always fresh. It's never frozen. It's here. We don't need credit. We've got it in abundance here, now, at this moment. It's here, it's with us. And it's with us at five minutes to 11. And it will be with us at 10 past 11. Today, tomorrow, next day, forever. Because God's promise is, I am with you always. I will never leave you. I am here. And that's the cause for our hope. That's how we deal with tomorrow, with hope. Hope based on the promise of God today. And I open my eyes and if I can just see, if I can go beyond that stage of being in control myself so that I may see what God wishes to offer me, then my life 
will be taken away the fear because perfect love casts out fear. And it's not my perfect love, it's God's perfect love. Because when we hear that, sometimes we think, well, I haven't got perfect love. No, but God has. And he wishes to share it with us. And he shares it with us here, now, at this moment, at four minutes to 11. Every moment, every time. So therefore, we can only live in the present moment. How many times in your life have you had something you're really worried about, you're anxious about? I had to go to a hospital appointment a while ago and I was really worried. I was anxious. I was anxious about it for a long time. And as I got closer to it, I got more anxious. It didn't make any difference to the appointment. And when I got in there, it turned out I was nothing I had to be anxious about. And that's what happens to us. When we are in the moment, when we are faced with what's happening... There is a strength which is called God's grace. The grace of the present moment. And these words of living in the present moment go throughout the whole of the story of our faith. Starting with the Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us next Wednesday week our daily bread. No, no, he doesn't say that. He says, give us this day our daily bread. Give us the bread we need today. Take up your cross every third Tuesday of the month. No, take up your cross every day and come and follow me. That wonderful hymn, Lord, for tomorrow and its needs, I do not pray. Help me, guide me, Love me, Lord, just for today. And it's just for today that the Lord will be with us. It is just for today and every day and every moment. Whatever life in the future may look like, we place in God's loving hands. Whatever we may have done in the past, we deal with through forgiveness and reconciliation with forgiveness and reconciliation on one side and with hope and trust in the future on the other side we can live today we can live well today so that we don't get dragged down by the past or paralyzed with fear about the future we can find a truth that will set us free today here Now, at 2 minutes to 11, on Tuesday, the 21st of April, 2020. It is here, it is now, it is God's gracious gift to us. And that's the truth, and it's the truth of God, and it's the truth of the light of God that shines on us. And as that light shines on us, we begin to have our eyes opened, so that we may see that we are not mortgaged to the past and we are not we don't have to be terrified of the future because the grace of God is where God walked among us and the word became flesh and lived among us God is here with us and he sends his spirit and in these days before Pentecost we pray that we may have these gifts of the spirit to help us to see the truth, the light of the good news so that I am no longer a slave of the past. I'm no longer held in fear of the future. But Lord, give me today my daily bread and forgive me my trespasses and lead me not into temptation, but deliver us all from evil. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Mass follows at 12 o'clock today.